Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Nova AG Republican Candidate Committee Forum. My name is Andrew LaPosser, Chair of the 8th Congressional District Republican Committee, and I will be serving as the MC this evening. This event is hosted by the 8th, 10th, and 11th Congressional Districts and the Fairfax County Republicans. And on behalf of each of your Nova Republican committees, I would like to welcome you and thank, thank all of you for joining us this evening. Like you, we're looking forward to hearing for, to hearing the visions and plans that our candidates have um, have tonight to move our great Commonwealth forward. I'd also like to take a minute and uh, thank the sponsors we have for this evening, um, Ivan Racklin and Melissa Bodwin. Also want to take a, a moment and especially thank Melissa. Melissa has worked um, extremely hard to put this event together. It really would not be uh, happening without her. And so Melissa, thank you again for all your hard work in putting this together. together. We have just a few preliminary things to go over, and I want to do that now. Um, we have a few people tonight that I'll introduce you to. Um, to begin the program this evening, I want to introduce you to Deb Bodlander. Deb is president of the 8th District's Colonial Mount Vernon Republican Women's Club, and she will lead us in the invocation this evening. Heavenly Father, we gather together this evening to meet our Republican candidates for Attorney General for our party. Bless them as they strive to engage with our Republican voters and help each one of them in their endeavor to overcome the many obstacles that exist in winning a campaign for elective office. Shelter them from negativity and support them as they attempt to attain the respected office of Attorney General of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Bless all those present tonight, as well as those we will encounter in working to make our party grow and be an effective tool for better governance. Ready us to make every moment count. Help us do what needs to be done without rancor or resentment, for we are all on the same team. Heal those who are suffering grief and pain due to COVID or other illnesses. Remember with special affection your servants, Alice Butler Short and G. Gordon Liddy, and welcome them with open arms to eternal peace and happiness. Each was a special kind of leader whose lives will long be appreciated and remembered by many of us. Protect all our law enforcement officers from those with evil intentions, as well as those involved in the security of our nation. Give them the tools and spiritual fortitude to meet every day with new vigor. Help us as Republicans strive for a better community, commonwealth, and country. Strengthen our confidence in who you have made us to be. Set us to work together efficiently and for the benefit of our party and our shared values. For it is in the principles of the creed that we find comfort and purpose and the motivation to do your will. Father, thank you for gathering us together this evening, and may we derive strength from each other as we go forth this election season to do what is right and good in your eyes. In your name we pray and let us say, Amen. Amen. Hey, thank you so much, Deb. I also want to introduce Britton Hammond. Uh, Britton, li Britton lives in the 8th Congressional District, and he's our Republican nominee for the House of Delegates in the 43rd District. I'm happy to have you here tonight, Britton, and Britton will also be leading us in the pledge. Thank you. If everyone will join me, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Also, thank you, Brenton, for the um, for the pledge. Also, I want to introduce Susan Valentine. Um, Susan's vice chair of the 8th District Republican Committee, and tonight she's going to be uh, reading the Republican Creed for us. Thank you, Andrew. We believe that the free justice system is the most productive supplier of human needs and economic justice. That all individuals are entitled to, entitled to equal rights, justice, and opportunities, and should assume their responsibilities as citizens in a free society. 
that fiscal responsibility and budgetary restraints must, must be exercised at all levels of government, that the federal government must preserve individual liberty by observing constitutional limitations, that peace is best preserved through a strong national defense, and that faith in God as recognized by our founding fathers is essential to the moral fiber of the nation. Thank you so much, Susan, for uh, reading the pledge tonight. Also, got the distinct honor of introducing you to RPV State Chairman Rich Anderson. Um, Rich is the State Party Chairman, and he's going to say a few words on tonight's meeting. Can you hear me? We can, Rich. Yes. All right. Well, thanks very much for having me here tonight. Just very briefly, uh, I thank everyone tonight for participating uh, in this evening's discussion among four outstanding candidates for the Office of Attorney General of the Commonwealth of Virginia. And I would like to also thank um, 8th Congressional District Chair Andrew LaPasser, 10th Congressional District Chair Gary Higgins, and 11th Congressional District Chair uh, Melissa Bodwin for putting on this series of discussions for our candidates for all three statewide public offices. Tonight, we obviously uh, confront a defining moment for our party. It is an inflection moment for our fellow Republicans here in Virginia, for this is the year when we can elect Republicans to the Office of Governor, Lieutenant Governor, and Attorney General, and get the necessary seats to flip the House of Delegates back to Republican control. And so I look forward to the journey from now until our RPV State Convention on May the 8th. And then after that, the long sprint to November 2nd, when I expect that we will prevail in those elections. So thanks to all of you for being here and for having me on tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for being here tonight and sharing a few words with, with us before the, uh, before the forum. And also thank you to the cans for being here. I just want to go over some rules real, real quick. Um, we're Republicans, we love law and order, and we love rules. So I'm about to read the rules to you tonight. And if you've got any questions as I'm reading them, please let me know to ensure that everyone understands. Um, surrogates, surrogates will not be allowed to participate in place of a candidate. Two, candidates may not participate from a car or vehicle. Three, during the debate, the candidates will keep their cameras on at all times. Four, candidates who drop off from the webinar or join late may retake their place in the rotation, but may not gain back time if they miss an opportunity to speak. Um, no participant in the forum shall be allowed to use props or visuals. Candidates may refer to limited notes as prompts. Candidates may write notes for their own use throughout the program. No rebuttal or write of reply opportunities will be available at any time. The candidates are not allowed to interrupt one another. Um, we have the moderators, our rules committee, and the technical team are, will, be, will be present to enforce the rule. Um, interruptions may result in a candidate being removed from the forum. I'm sure we don't have to worry about that tonight. Um, if a candidate experiences technical issues on their side, they may be dropped from the stream while they correct the problem. Again, that's if it's on your side. Um, all questions are predetermined. None of these questions are going to be taken from the virtual audience. Um, any commentary, analysis, or follow-up questions from the moderators isn't going to be permitted. Questions will be answered in rotation. Candidates will have as much of an equal opportunity as possible to be the first, middle, and last to answer questions. Uh, initial ordering will be in alphabetical order by candidates' last names. Each candidate will be allowed a three-minute introduction, two minutes to answer each question, 30 seconds to answer each question in our lightning round, and two minutes for closing comments. Each candidate will receive a 15 second warning and a call of time when their allotted time has elapsed. Each candidate will have five seconds to complete their sentence and they will be muted. All right, now as we turn the program over, um, it's my pleasure to introduce you to the team that will be facilitating tonight's Attorney General Forum. Uh, so first, I want to introduce the moderator from the 8th Congressional District, 8th um, Congressional District SEC Rep, uh, Vincent Palathingle. Our moderator from the 10th is 10th District SEC Rep, Heather Rice. 
the moderator from the 11th Congressional District is Fairfax County GOP Chairman Steve Knotts. Our technology and timekeeper is Fairfax County GOP Vice Chair Sean Ratstatler. And our rules and committee members are chairs of the 8th, 11th Congressional Districts, Gary Higgin and Melissa Bodwin. And um, Vincent, I will go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you, Andrew. Candidates, now it is time for your three minutes opening statements. I will call Ms. Leslie Haley first, followed by Mr. Jason Mieras, Mr. Chuck Smith, and Mr. Jack White in that order. Ms. Leslie Haley, it's your turn. Thank you. And thank you all tonight for hosting this wonderful event and bringing us all together. This is really, really a critical time um, in Virginia history and a real great opportunity. And so I've stepped up to run for attorney general and I just let me tell you a little bit about my background and why I'm in this race. First of all, I'm probably the unique candidate and that I have 10 years of business background with Philip Morris before I ever went to law school. And that then led to my career in law and I happen to be an ethics attorney um, practicing in very, you know, a wide variety of different areas, admitted in every court in Virginia, admitted in our federal courts, admitted in our US Supreme Court handling all types of matters across the spectrum of my practice. But what really caused me to stand up, I think, to run is obviously the current environment that exists in Virginia and the opportunities that exist in this great, um, in this great commonwealth. Now, the attorney general really is like the corporate lawyer for the state of Virginia. And the opportunity for us to um, advance that and take that to a new level that actually incorporates more than just partnering with our law enforcement communities and bringing back public safety and safety to our citizens, but also the deregulation of business that has really affected the economic impact of our economy in Virginia. Now I happen to sit on the Board of Supervisors in Chesterfield and I'm in my second term and I've um, had the privilege of being uh, chair for the last two years as my colleagues have um, have asked me to serve in that position. And we've done many, many things that advance the same issues that we're facing today. We've very much advanced and, and positioned our children to be in school. We opened our schools back in September, said, we can't get them in there for education. These are citizens' buildings. We're gonna open them and allow our um, YMCAs to come in there and deliver services to our citizens. We then stood tall with our men and women in blue, especially as we advanced and watched what was happening in our city, as folks were burning our city and the rule of law was completely ignored. There were absolutely no repercussions. Nobody was um, arrested. Our men and women in blue walked beside the men and women in blue in the city for two days. And then when they were told they stand down, we brought them back to Chesterfield. We've advanced a comp plan that actually right now we are 100% fully staffed in our police department. And then the last important thing I think is what we've done for our small businesses, which is the core of the Commonwealth of Virginia. We took federal monies, we came up with grant programs, we recognized that keeping our small businesses alive, keeping our families engaged was critically important. And so those are just some of the examples of things I've done and reasons I came to the table. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Haley. And now it's uh, Jason Mieras. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. I'm Delegate Jason Mieras. I represent one of those districts we have to be able to win, to be able to win in the fall. Ralph Northam's won my district. I've won with an average of 60% of the vote. I'm a former prosecutor. I think that's so critical. As my friend Bob McDonald likes to say, this is literally running to be Virginia's top cop. I've literally been in the run in front of state juries and state judges and, and um, state felons and put violent actors away. Uh, but listen, I think it's also important for everybody to listen to know who I am and what I really believe as a candidate and what I believe as attorney general. You have to know kind of where I came from. And anybody knows the story of Miara's, it's a little different, um, the name, but uh, my my family story kind of began in Havana, Cuba, when my mother fled uh, Cuba in the fall of 1965, literally penniless and homeless, not knowing where her next meal was going to come from. And so when you grow up in a household of someone who's literally experienced the horrors and the scars of socialism, uh, it's not just a theory. It's not something in a textbook. It's real. It's visceral. And, uh, you know, my mother saw it up close in a very real, horrific sense. So my mother fled Cuba in the fall of 1965, literally with nothing. 
And almost 50 years to the day that she left, she was able to vote for her son to represent her in the oldest democracy in the Western Hemisphere, uh, the Virginia House of Delegates. Now, uh, that's what I like to call the American miracle. But I think we all recognize the American miracle uh, is being challenged in ways we've never thought in a million years would be challenged before. As my mother told me uh, not too long ago, she never thought the rhetoric and the language she used to hear on the streets of Havana, Cuba, she'd be hearing in America today. And so we know on a, on a variety of different fronts, on so many different levels, we're being challenged both in election integrity, both in what we're doing with our prison system, closing of our schools, on the parole board that's literally breaking the wall to let violent criminals back out on our streets. Well, listen, one of the big reasons why I'm running is uh, so many Virginians and so many Americans feel like nobody has their back. Uh, if you're an individual who's having your religious liberty violated, you certainly don't feel like anybody has your back. If you're a business owner right now struggling to survive, and in some cases having the office of the attorney general sue you just because you're trying to keep your doors open and put food on the uh, plates of your family, nobody has your back. If you're the victim of violent crime, you see what's happening in this general assembly. We just had veto session earlier today and more and more bills that have a criminal first, victim last mindset that's gonna make Virginians less safe and less secure. You certainly don't feel like anybody has your back. Well, I'm running for attorney general for those people that feel right now that everybody's letting them down, government's letting them down, the media's letting them down, pop culture's letting them down. I want them to be able to keep and look up and realize that somebody has their back, somebody's in their corner, and that's what my pledge is if I have the honor of serving as your attorney general. Because we know that this American miracle that has created more opportunity and more second chances for more people than any country in the history of the world is now under literally under under a siege right now. And so it's an honor to run. Looks like the trap door is gonna cut me off. So look forward to the discussion. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Mr. Mayeras. Now, Mr. Chuck Smith, it's your turn. Yes, it's, it's certainly an honor to be with you all here today. Thank you for allowing us to come. Listen, my message is not gonna change from week to week, month to month. Uh, when you look at the streets burning, cities burning, towns burning, counties burning, and the police stations burning, and killings and stores being looted, and you can't tell peaceful protesters from, from terrorists, I'm running for attorney general on the rights of the people. You see, I believe that we need an attorney general who will hold accountable anybody who disrupts, distorts, devalues an election who commits fraud or who disenfranchises the Virginia voter. I think we need an attorney general to hold accountable anyone who uh, takes, takes the, the, the good patriotism of this country, takes, takes the, the good values of this country and tries somehow to put it on the back burner, put it behind the scenes. We need someone who's gonna stand up for God, stand up for the constitution, stand up for faith. We need someone who's gonna say no to red flag law, no to one gun a month law, no to uh, having the city councils and legislative bodies continue to rob us of our rights one after another. I am I believe that an attorney general should be running not just on the rights of the people, but on the freedoms of Americans. I'm running for attorney general so that Americans, Virginians, patriots can lift their heads up, lift their backs up, lift their values up, lift their vision up, and turn this ship around. Because never before in the history of this country, we know this, has our constitution been more at risk. Never before in the history of the United States have the rights of men, the freedoms of Americans been more at stake. If there ever was a time that we get back to common sense leadership, get back to the top of the issues that matter to Virginians, get back to God, get back to family, that time has come. But first, we have to select new leaders who've not had their hands sullied in the ways of the past in what I call a good old boy system that has rocked this party and nearly brought it to his knees, where favoritism has been more important than character, where courage, uh, has been less important than cronyism and where endorsements have been more important than the conscience of the American voter. No, I'm running for attorney general so we can say to those people who are robbing our rights day by day by day, passing law after law after law, that laws don't give us our rights. God gave us our rights. We were born with rights. The Constitution doesn't give us our freedoms. We were born free, born with freedoms. God has helped us build this country and the devil himself is trying to tear it all down. So I'm here because we need to stop the socialists, the globalists, the anarchists from continuing to take God out of the classroom, God out of the courtroom, God out from the halls of justice and the constitution off the mantle. We need an attorney general who is pro-America, pro-Virginia, pro-life, pro-constitution, pro-school choice, anti-mandates, anti-government encroachments, and a card-carrying, gun-toting, Bible-ready patriot for this country. 
Thank you all, and God bless you all. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Now it is Jack White. Well, thank you. It is wonderful to be with my neighbors here in Northern Virginia, and I welcome the opportunity to introduce myself to those of you whom I may not have met. I am a former law clerk to conservative Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito. I'm a graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point and a United States Army veteran. And I am a member of the Northern Virginia business community and a representer of many of our businesses. I believe that Virginia needs new representation. That is why I'm running for attorney general. Now, several years ago, my wife and I, after having lived all over the country, had to decide where we would call home. Previously, when we had lived in Virginia, our oldest graduated from high school and we loved the school. Our youngest was born when we lived here while I was clerking at the United States Supreme Court and I was gone all the time, but I felt that my family was safe. And I was at the time about to buy into a law firm and become a business owner in Virginia was good for business, but schools, safety, uh, good for business. I've watched all of those deteriorate over the past decade plus, and that's why I'm running for attorney general. Now, look, I have litigated against Kamala Harris when she was attorney general of California and won. I have represented families who in the midst of this pandemic environment wanted nothing other than to worship, and I got them back to church. I have the only open litigation to get one of our public school systems here in Virginia open five days a week so our kids can get back to school. When the Trump administration needed to look into sexual harassment and sexual assault in the army after the murder of Vanessa Guillen out in Texas, they called upon me. In fact, I've, I'm still on the Department of the Army payroll to help fix that large scale problem because I'm a leader. I understand organizational dynamics. I understand the dynamics that currently exist in the office of the attorney general. And I have led units with many more than 300 individuals under circumstances more stressful than running an attorney general's office. Now, I know that justice is blind, but Mark Herring is not. And I look forward to talking with you further this evening. Thank you, Mr. White. Now I invite my fellow moderator, Heather Rice, for the first question. Welcome to round one candidates. The first question is constitutional issues. You each have two minutes apiece. The candidate order is Maedis, Smith, White, and Harry. The question, on March 17th, Northern Virginia citizens learned that current and former teachers in Loudoun County are compiling a list of parents to question a curriculum based on critical race theory. As the Journal General, what is your plan to protect the civil liberties of parents and citizens and to stop radical activists and their agendas? Yeah, this is exactly the part of cancel culture that is beginning so insidious where it's not now just public figures, public athletes uh, or actors that say something or tweeted something 20 years ago. It is now private citizens that are now have this fear, this unbelievable fear they're afraid to speak up. And I hear it as a member of the House of Delegates, constituents that come to me that are complaining about what's being taught in their schools, what's being done in their school districts. I had a, a constituent that came to me who said that their 10-year-old child had to apologize in class uh, for being white, um, which I thought was just an absurd type of exercise. So we're literally at this stage where we are literally creating more division and more disunity in this country, unlike anything we've ever seen before. So as I said in my opening statement, as far as having their back, first of all, your problem is you have these liberal prosecutors 
in in Northern Virginia that there's literally laws right now on the book that says you can't. I know there's a Facebook group that also is basically trying to um, create a toxic environment and and create basically create a harassment situation for them. And my my message is, Attorney General, if you have a prosecutor, you have these people that are literally being victimized in the current state statutes. Uh, with harassment and violation through the internet, then I'm saying if you're a prosecutor and you have these prosecutors that will not they will not prosecute any misdemeanors, then then I would I would send notification as the attorney general saying if you're not willing to prosecute and protect these citizens and their right of free expression, their right of freedom of conscience, then allow me to step in. So I will. Um, so the way the attorney general's office works is anytime you want to prosecute a local crime, you have to get permission from the local commonwealth attorney. Obviously, you could do joint prosecutions with the with the feds, and that happens all the time. But I think it's absolutely critical and important to also use the office of attorney general as a bully pulpit and recognize that freedom of speech and freedom of conscience is absolutely sacred to this free exchange of ideas. And if that goes away, we go away as a country. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Okay. If, if, I can barely hear, hear you, but I'm going to go ahead anyway. I, I'm assuming you're telling me to go. Listen, not only will I hold uh, my Commonwealth attorneys accountable, but I will sue, uh, uh, whether it's President Biden, I will sue anyone who intends to disrupt our school system and to bring uh, cancel culture to bring critical race theory into the education process uh, of our kids. Nothing is more dear to people in Virginia, certainly in the United States, than their children. And I think the Constitution protects them. I do not believe for one minute that black people, and it really doesn't matter, black, white, yellow, I do not believe that we, we are still on the plantation. I do not believe that uh, every problem at its root is about race. Uh, whether you're black, white, uh, uh, yellow, green, whether you're tall, short, whether you're Democrat, independent, we pride our, our, our school systems with educating our children uh, in, in a way that is productive. I do not believe, nor will I tolerate uh, them using uh, race as every answer to every critical question. Uh, I think it's important that uh, our, our laws are enforced. I think it's important that our constitution is upheld. The attorney general's office has 17 distinct responsibilities, number one on the board, is upholding the Constitution. I personally think it's a violation of the Constitution uh, uh, to allow people to indoctrinate our students to one line of thinking that really at its heart is trying to keep black people on a plantation or at its heart is trying to keep uh, a race a as the central force uh, here in Virginia and throughout the United States. I don't believe that is the answer. And I think uh, as the Attorney General is uh, the attorney for each of the agencies in Virginia, I will make sure that the Department of Education understands that. That uh, again, just, just as I heard earlier, I don't think that it's our responsibility to allow people to come in this country uh, or, or people who are in this country to try to treat us as if we're still in the 1800s or the 1850s or the 1900s. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Mr. Wright. What we have in Virginia right now in our current attorney general is an endorser of approved lawlessness. And what I mean by that is when there are laws on the books or a constitution that governs us all and Mark Herring chooses to ignore it, that is approved lawlessness, that will come to an end. Now, what you are talking about in Loudoun is ignoring equal protection. It's ignoring freedom of speech. It's ignoring freedom of association. I translate, it's ignoring the constitution of the United States, and that will come to an end. Critical race theory is fundamentally flawed, and it's fundamentally flawed because it attributes backwards looking blame to people who had no role in the current state of affairs. Now, I am a believer in accountability on a forward looking basis and that we all have a role to play in a, on a forward looking basis. 
but critical race theory is not the answer. And impugning the associations of other members of the citizenry is absolutely contrary to our constitution. In Jack White, we will have an attorney general who abides by the constitution, but more importantly, who understands the constitution and how it applies to all of us. Thank you, Ms. Harry. Thank you. Well, let's start with, first of all, right now, we have an attorney general who is the attorney general for the party and not the attorney general for the citizens of Virginia. This attorney general is not upholding any of the constitutional rights that all of our citizens are entitled to. So it's very flawed. I can tell you, we need an attorney general that's not only gonna stand up for these constitutional rights, but is not afraid to sue the governor or Biden if that's what it's gonna take. But it's also gonna stand firm because this all starts from the position of the appointees of our Secretary of Education, our folks that are in these offices appointed by the current administration, down to what's happening in our classroom with our teachers. There needs to be accountabilities held to uphold the constitutional rights of our students, constitutional rights of our citizens. And you think back, I mean, I'm still appalled that we lost basically this freedom of religion in our schools. Many of us grew up you know, saying a prayer in school and recognizing that that is the foundation of who we are as a country. So standing up for these principles and these constitutional rights is absolutely a critical piece and a loud piece of the role of the attorney general. And I can tell you in our own school district this last year, what we watched was bullying by our teacher association to the teachers who wanted to get back in the classroom. And I can tell you when our school board basically ignored it, as chair of our board, I stood up and said, we're holding an audit. We're calling for an audit. We're gonna pull all of the emails, all of the communications that are going on out there. There are employees. We're gonna hold accountabilities. And that's what it's gonna take in a leader to hold accountabilities and then take the necessary action. Thank you, everyone. No, I can't hear. Hi, everybody. It's Steve Knotts. I was having a little bit of technical difficulty there, but I'm I'm back. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you, Heather. Um, I am trying to get to my questions here. So the candidate order for this round will be Mr. Smith and Mr. White, Ms. Haley, and Mr. Meares. On March 22nd, 2021, Circuit Judge Ricardo Reguel in Spotsylvania denied the state's motion for a temporary injunction to immediately shut down a restaurant that had lost its Virginia Department of Health licenses for violating Virginia's mask mandates, allowing the restaurant to remain open while awaiting trial. The restaurant alleges that mask mandates are unconstitutional. To what extent do you believe the mask mandate and other COVID-19 related mandates from the governor's office are constitutional? And what do you believe is the limit on the government's author governor's authority to issue such mandates? And again, we'll start with Mr. Smith. So I don't believe that any uh, statewide mandates from the governor's office are constitutional. Uh, I believe that the 10th Amendment allows the federal government to have only such power as it, I'm sorry, allows it, or certainly allows the federal government to have certain power but then it gives us the police power. It gives the state's power in those areas that belong to the states or to the people, uh, or states and to the people. And I think it's the role of the legislatures to determine what laws shall be governed or, or you know, what laws shall be passed here in Virginia. It is not the responsibility, uh, nor is, is it the authority of the uh, governor of a state to issue mandates. We, we saw particularly with not just a mask, but we saw particularly with the, the Second Amendment rights, where the governor felt that it was in his province to suspend certain constitutional rights. I don't think he is allowed to do that. Listen, the role of state government, and certainly the role of a governor, governor is to keep businesses open, not to, not to shut them down, not to find ways that they shall go out of business or shut them down. 
if people in their businesses and in, in, in their employments uh, exist and, and can function without masks, they ought to be allowed to do that. They have the freedom, they have, they have the freedom under the Constitution to do that. And certainly they, they, they have the rights under the state laws to do that. Remember, the legislature passes the laws. The governor does not pass any laws. I do not think the governor, while the, while the legislatures are in session, even if the laws were constitutional, I do not think that the governor's edicts should have the effect of law statewide. Uh, when I'm attorney general, I will make sure that the governors are reminded that their job is to keep businesses open, to keep the economy flowing. It is not the responsibility of the governor or state government to shut businesses down. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. White. The past eight years of Democrat rule in Virginia have demonstrated a fundamental misunderstanding of separation of power. There's a fundamental misunderstanding of the role of the attorney general, but we all, we've also seen a misunderstanding of the role of the government. Now, the Constitution does provide uh, that states have police powers, health, safety, welfare, and we can understand it. We were in the midst of a pandemic, but those powers may not infringe upon individual liberties, particularly not indefinitely, particularly not when the CDC and the Virginia Department of Health has made declarations about the safety of various other environments. Governor Northam engaged in overreach and he continues to do so with regard to these mandates. It is the role of the Attorney General as an independent to rein in other branches of government, other arms of the executive branch of Virginia state government when they go too far. And that's exactly what I would do. Thank you, Mr. White. Ms. Haley. Thank you. I think this follows up exactly again that what we've seen over the last eight years is not indicative of a strong executive attorney general. What we've seen is the attorney general who has basically drank the Kool-Aid of the party and done exactly what the party would like that attorney general to do. You know, attorney general is held to the standard of basically, you know, administering the rule of law. It's the everyone's equally accountable under the law. Everyone is equally um, responsible to the con upholding the constitutional rights of our citizens. You know, this is an exact example um, of total overreach. And when you see that the messages that are coming out of whether it's the CDC or the Virginia Department of Health are actually somewhat contradictory, it's really very, very frustrating to see an attorney general who has been unwilling to step up to the plate and challenge those laws on behalf of our citizens, on behalf of our business interests, on behalf of our students and our children. And so I think that this absolutely um, you know, is, is an example of overreach and an underperforming, just party serving attorney general. Thank you, Ms. Haley. Mr. Villares. Thank you for the question, Stephen. Actually, I read the opinion. And uh, when I became aware of the situation, I actually reached out to Matthew Strickland. The, the, the case involved, this is a wonderful restaurant in Spotsylvania called Gourmelts. Matthew Strickland is, by every definition, uh, trying to do the right thing. He is an Afghanistan war veteran. Uh, he came back home from serving and defending our freedoms overseas, and he started a small business with his wife and his mother-in-law. And when I visited him, all three were working behind the counter, uh, his, his wife and mother-in-law from Chile, and they were literally doing everything they can to just, quite frankly, survive in this COVID world. And as Matthew told me, he said, you know, Jason, I was faced with this choice. I could either maintain and keep my business open or I could close it down and not be able to put food on the plates of my children um, and continue to feed my family. And as he asked me, he's like, what choice do you make? And I think that is something that shows you both the power of the attorney general's office, either for good or quite frankly, for going after the, the, the little guy. And it kind of reminds me of those the great Toronto Reagan, the scariest words in the English language can be hello, we're from the government, we're here to help. 
And Matthew Strickland literally has seen his life turned upside down because the Office of the Attorney General is suing him and trying to literally shut him down. By the way, he has several dozen employees, so all of them would be out of work. And he is literally trying to survive. It shows the exact opposite mentality of what the Office of Attorney General should be. So first of all, I want to encourage anybody who's listening tonight, if you want to stand with a, a patriot, go to Gourmelts, go there, spend money. Uh, they are obviously struggling because every, every other business is struggling uh, during the pandemic, but they are literally at the front line trying to stand up to an attorney general that is shutting them down because he simply wants to feed his family. It just shows just how far gone the misplaced priorities. And you can see the, the circuit judge's, judge's opinion online. It's, it's excellent. Thank you, Mr. Miyadas. So the next question, we'll bring back my friend Vincent Palithingo. Thank you, Steve. Um, for the next question, we will follow the order. Uh, first, it will be Mr. White, Ms. Haley, uh, Mr. Mayers, and then Mr. Smith. This is the question. What is the most disastrous policy of the current Attorney General Herring's administration that you will work to reverse and why? Go ahead. Mr. White. So what is most disastrous about General Herring? Is yeah, the most disastrous policy of the current. The most disastrous is his disregard of his role as counsel to the various boards and agencies throughout the state, okay? The impact of that is wide reaching. We saw it when we looked at the disaster with regard to the parole board, okay? Families who are victims having to find out at a mailbox that their assailant has been freed when they weren't even involved in the process. Uh, the, the whistleblower being accosted and victimized when all she was trying to do was call to the attention of the authorities pervasive wrongdoing, but it's not just with the parole board. With the Department of Education, there have been similar problems with an absent attorney general. One of the things that I'm hearing a lot as I travel throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia is that people call in for help to the attorney general's office and they receive nothing. So the most disastrous component is a deprofessionalization of the office. The office of the attorney general should be an office where people can go for recourse, where people can go to have their freedoms protected. Instead, there's absence there and there are reasons for it. Uh, the people who work in that office understand that they are supporting an attorney general with a political agenda. I mentioned that justice is blind but Mark Herring is not. The fact of the matter is his eyes are wide open to the next step. And that's why we need an attorney general who is running for attorney general to be the attorney general. Thank you, Mr. White. Ms. Haley. Thank you. So to add on to that, let me just tell you, the attorney general has completely circumvented his role. So the attorney general, in looking at what we are getting coming and seeing come out of our general assembly, this is where the laws are made. And part of the attorney general's role is to make certain that they are tracking legislation that is pending. And in this case, should be looking at this legislation that is going to, in fact, violate constitutional principles, constitutional rights of our citizens, and hold accountabilities in advance. Basically saying, you wanna go down that line, then let me just give you the opinion now of what that legislation means and how we're gonna challenge that legislation. And so again, when you've got an attorney general that's the attorney general for the party and it's the party in control, we see what's happening and it's just basic lawlessness. In addition to that, we know because we've seen examples where Republican members of the General Assembly have come to the attorney general and asked for written opinions and the attorney general has ignored those and that's part of the role of the job of attorney general is to issue written opinions to other executive branches, other state agencies regarding issues in advance. 
our attorney general has completely ignored those and I've seen Republican state legis legislators share that with me. So we need an attorney general that goes back to the fundamentals of being the attorney for the citizens of Virginia, the attorney that's going to uphold the constitution and step into that role, recognizing there are going to be challenges and fights and they're not afraid to take them on. Thank you, Ms. Haley. Ms. Ramirez. Listen, I guess it, it, because it's on everybody's mind, at least it's all over the newspaper, this attorney general literally failed the, the citizens of Virginia when it came to this parole board. I like to say your safety is my mission. That's the opposite of Mark Herring. And now we know from this whistleblower that's come forward that the attorney general's office was neck deep and they were quite aware the parole board was literally breaking the law in order to let out cop killers and rapists back out on the street. Vincent Martin was sentenced to 30 years in prison for multiple armed robberies. He gets out after serving only six years. He's out not even a year. He commits another armed robbery. While he's leaving the scene of that armed robbery, he's stopped by a young 23-year-old Richmond police officer by the name of Michael Connors. Michael Connors approaches the car. He's shot in the neck. He's on the ground struggling. Vincent Martin gets out of the car and puts three bullets in his head. He was then given life without the possibility of parole. And what happened? Well, I always understood that to mean you never get out. But in today's new quote, progressive Virginia, Vincent Martin's back on the street right now. When he was asked this summer, this past summer, if he had any regrets, he said no. You had Gregory Joyner, who literally abducted, strangled, and raped a beautiful 15-year-old girl, Sarah Jamison. Two years ago, the parole board said, don't let this man out. He has a history of violence. Sarah Jamison's back on, I mean, Gregory Joyner's back on the street. And Sarah Jamison never even got to celebrate her prom. So the fact that one of the most important, if not the most important position of the attorney general, is, as it's been noted um, by, by people that have served in that role, is you're Virginia's top cop. And, and this attorney general has utterly, completely failed. And what's worse is they broke the law to do it. You're required to make every worthwhile attempt to notify the families of the victims before these murderers and rapists get back on the street. And we have seen from the whistleblower that they didn't even attempt to notify the victims. And what has happened is this attorney general and this governor and this general assembly, they're not investigating the parole board, they're investigating the inspector general. It is, it is absurdity on top of absurdity and they're doing everything they can to create a criminal first victim last mindset in Richmond and it needs to stop. Thank you, Mr. Mayors. Next, Mr. Smith. I, I believe without a shadow of a doubt, uh, without any equivocation whatsoever, the most disastrous aspect of the current attorney general's role is the derision of the Constitution. Ask yourself, who is the attorney general for people who believe they have the First Amendment right to worship their God in their churches? Who is the attorney general for the people who believe they have the First Amendment right to assemble? Who is the attorney general for the people that they have the First Amendment right to speak their mind, express themselves, whether on on social media against big tech or whether it's on their streets or in their neighborhoods or participate in rallies? Who is the attorney general for the people that believe they have the right to bear arms where it says shall not be infringed? Who is the attorney general for the people that believe they have the right against unreasonable searches and seizures where government can go in their homes, where they can go in their cars? Who is the attorney general for the people who, who, who is the attorney general for the unborn? Uh, uh, who, is their, who is their lawyer? Who represents the unborn in these disastrous policies of the governor? Who is the attorney general for them when, when the governor wants to make them comfortable? Who is the attorney general for the people who believe that they have the right, the God-given rights guaranteed by the Constitution to, to, to maintain their businesses, to, to make a living, to earn a living, support their families? Who is the attorney general for the people who believe they have the right to vote and, 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 and that their votes can't be discounted or that they can't be disenfranchised by illegal or dead people voting? Who is the attorney general for the people that believe they have the equal protection, the, the equal protection rights under the equal protection clause? I submit to you that when we take away the Constitution, when we deride the Constitution, all of our rights disappear. The single most disastrous policy of the attorney general is fundamental in his responsibilities. Number one on his 17 areas of responsibilities is upholding the Constitution, and he has failed to do that. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Now I invite Heather, Mrs. Heather Rice for the next question. Candidates, welcome to question four. The question regards campaign candidate NOVA election strategy. 
you each have two minutes to respond. The candidate order will be Haley, Nieves, Smith, and White. The question is, when we go to the polls in November, one of you will be running against a Democrat for the Office of Attorney General. Northern Virginia has trended blue for over a decade, yet gaining votes in Northern Virginia is critical to winning a statewide election. Maybe the two to three issues you would focus on to win over Northern Virginia voters in the general election. Ms. Haley. Thank you. So first of all, I sit in a district that is completely blue. I represent the Midlothian district. School board below me went blue. The um, delegate above me, the, the senator, and I can tell you right now, through this whole conversation of return to school, moms and parents are turning against these elected blues. And I think that's a critical piece. I think we, that we can stand strong, and I've stood strong back in, in September, very loud about putting our children back in school, opening our citizens' buildings, expressing an ability to return these buildings to our citizens and show them how programs can work in those buildings. I think that's really critically important. I also so think it's critically important that the messaging of keeping our families safe, you know, restoring law and order, whether it be through accountabilities of the parole board, accountabilities regarding um, some of the other issues that are going on that happen, like in the city with rioting in the city of Richmond, I can tell you there was absolutely no rule of law there. Our police, our men and women in blue were told to stand down. And so standing strong for our men and women in blue and actually in engaging in safe communities is a universal message. And the third, I think across the board, while we're in this uncertainty about you know, where we go with voter integrity, I think that both parties have an interest in voter integrity and having this conversation and being very candid and open about how voter integrity can work and can be equitable is critically important. And I think that brings people across both spectrums to the plate. Thank you, Ms. Haley. Mr. Mieras. I mean, listen, as far as who we're uh, going to face in the fall, I like to joke that Democrats right now are in a woke-off. Uh, that's their competition. They're trying to see who's more liberal, who's more left, who's more extreme, who's more out of touch with your average everyday Virginian. And I think at the end of the day, it's going to come back and, and haunt them because you have, in my opinion, two of the most liberal left-wing candidates ever run for the office of attorney general. And listen, as far as drawing a contrast, I think it's important. I mean, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm a former prosecutor. I think when you wanna make this and talk about Virginia's top cop, I think it's important for somebody who's literally have that in their background as, as somebody who's prosecuted uh, violent felons. But listen, I look forward to the debate to be able to go in Northern Virginia and say, listen, uh, my opponent supported ending the mandatory reporting requirement of sexual assault in your schools. I opposed it. My opponents uh, voted and, and supported the early release of violent offenders back in our neighborhoods, and I oppose it. Uh, my opponents support closing their schools and, and shoving down this virtual learning uh, that is literally uh, crippling an entire generation of Virginians, and I oppose it. And so I think drawing that contrast on these issues that are really affecting everyday Virginians in Northern Virginia, and quite frankly, it's also being able to talk about to our our large immigrant community, whether it's our Korean American, our Indian American, our Latino American, is basically saying, you know, listen, I, 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 I've been a child of somebody who literally came here with nothing. And the beauty of the fact that I understand in my core, in my DNA, that America is a nation of second chances. That is who we are as a people. We are fundamentally a good and decent and noble country. We are nowhere what this media and pop culture tries to portray us as. We're a good and decent and noble country. And so having that message, I think, of optimism, of aspiration, of bringing people together, I think is going to be critical as well, both on the public safety front, but also appealing to those voters that are culturally conservative and should be with us. And I know we can we can have the right message. Uh, we can reach all of them. Thank you, Mr. Mieres. Mr. White. Mr. White or Mr. Smith? My apologies, Mr. Smith. Thank you. Okay. All right. Yes, we don't want Mr. White to get ahead of me. Let him wait his turn. <laughs> uh, listen, uh, I think the question is very intuitive. 
uh, as Republicans, we have lost every single election in a row in the last 10 statewide. And if we're not careful, we're gonna lose again. The voters are looking for something different. The voters not looking to being talked at. They're, being, they're, they're looking to being talked with. I think it's very important that we dispense with the hot air and that we do for Northern Virginia, for Southwest Virginia, what we do to people naturally. And that is to be present. We have to be present with them on the issues that affect them. In Northern Virginia, just like out Southwest, they are concerned about safe schools. They're concerned about safe neighborhoods. They're concerned about safe homes, of the rioting and, 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 and the looting and the disruption. Uh, that plays well in Northern Virginia, just as it plays well elsewhere. They're concerned about religious freedom. They're concerned about being able to worship God in their churches. Uh, they don't want dictatorial policies. They don't want the cancel culture. They don't want the policies that are destroying this country. I think Northern Virginia plays well on issues of patriotism. They're looking for people to bring to them a language that they can understand, that, that this is America, that this is Virginia. This is, not South, this is not South America. This is not the place where people are, are, are dying to come to, they're coming from. This is not Europe. This is the United States of America. And people wanna believe that they can make a home, raise a family here and be secure here. So I think an attorney general that, in fact, any elected official, but certainly attorney general that speaks to them in those terms. If you're gonna be attorney general, then dispense with the, with the hot air. How do we enforce the laws? How do we bring security? And how do we let people know that we will stand with them against the ridiculousness of changing names of schools, the ridiculousness of changing names of streets, but getting back to, to mom and dad, being able to keep a job, being able to go to work, having an employment there that's there for them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Now, Mr. White. Now, Mr. White, look, I do not need to conjecture on how to reach out to people in Northern Virginia. I am in Northern Virginia and I chose Northern Virginia after having lived all over the country. I'll tell you this, I will start by agreeing with Ralph Northam. Ralph Northam said that Mark Herring should not be the attorney general because he endorsed uh, Mark Herring's opponent. Here's somewhere where Ralph Northam and I agree, but I will go back to my thought process when I chose Virginia for my family. We were looking at schools. Look, I have been the chairman of the Fairfax County Public Schools Education Foundation. I have talked with and worked with parents here in Fairfax. I have worked hard on behalf of parents trying to make the state of Virginia be true to what it said on paper and provide high quality education. Safety, look, there is this culture of defunding police. We don't need to defund the police. We need to fund police and then some, provide them with all of the ancillary services that make the people of Northern Virginia feel safe and make law enforcement know that they've got an attorney general who has their back good for business. Look, I was on the executive committee of the Northern Virginia Chamber of Commerce. And the only reason I got off that is to get on the uh, executive committee of the Virginia Chamber of Commerce to help with thought leadership on getting us back to business. We got to get back to school, but we have to get back to business. That's what people in Northern Virginia care about. And that's why they're going to be sympathetic and very welcoming of my candidates. Thank you, Mr. White. Thank you, all candidates. I am now turning over to Steve Knotts, who will get question five. Thank you, Heather. Uh, the order for this question will be Mr. Mayeres, Mr. Smith, Mr. White, and then Ms. Haley. Here in Northern Virginia, a group called the Coalition for TJ is suing the Fairfax County Public Schools in the Eastern District of Virginia, alleging the new TJ admissions policy violates the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment by intentionally discriminating against Asian Americans. What role should the Attorney General's Office play in ensuring that the school admissions policies remain fair and equal for all Virginians, particularly in schools like TJ, 
other governor schools and institutions of higher learning in the Commonwealth? We'll start with Mr. Mietis. Well, I think this is a great example of the Attorney General's office literally getting involved in, in areas it shouldn't. Um, and it, it's, it's uh, I'm a passionate believer in meritocracy. I think if you have the grades and you're an achiever, there's nobody, no one at any time should achieve, should prevent you from achieving your dreams. And that's the opposite of what we're saying with, quite frankly, some of the members of the far left in charge of the, the admissions policies is they're saying to some of these schools, you have diversity, but you don't have, quote, the right diversity. And so they are literally discriminating against Asian Americans and Indian Americans. And it, it goes to a great, uh, quite frankly, a great debate where we have a diversity, where diversity is trumping unity. You know, when you separate the roots from a tree, you kill a tree. You need diversity. Diversity is like the roots in a tree, and the more diversity you have in some ways, the stronger the tree. But the problem is, is right now, if you separate the roots from that tree, if you only focus on that, you almost create like this balkanization mindset in America that actually leads to disunity. E plunius unum means out of many, one. The problem with the left right now is they just want to focus on the many, and they never want to talk about the one. We have so much more as a country that unites us than divides us. But that's not what they're doing. They want to put everybody in a separate little silo. And so as a result, you're literally having Asian American, Indian American students that are being discriminated. We know they're being discriminated against in college admissions, and now they're being discriminated against in high school. And so the attorney general's office should be supporting meritocracy. If you have the grades, you should be able to achieve your aspirational dreams. You should not have any lawyer. You sure as heck should not have some politician who's closing that door of opportunity to you. Because ultimately, that creates an America that is almost unrecognizable. We should be basically saying there's nowhere, no how, no one's going to prevent you from achieving your dreams and your aspirations. And that's the opposite of what this attorney general is doing right now. Sorry about that. Mr. Smith. All right, good. So yes, I, I, I think this is an opportunity. Uh, this, this is the ripe opportunity for the Attorney General to be involved. Uh, I think, uh, it, aside from the Attorney General's personal uh, opinion, I think Virginia students uh, need an opportunity to excel. I think it, discriminate, it discriminates against no one to allow students to be able to uh, compete on a higher level or, or, or higher levels and to be able to determine that some people uh, 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 don't study well. Some people do study well. Uh, I, I think it's a further discrimination, if you will, to, to require everyone to, to study at the same level or, or, or to ex excel at the same level. And, and I think the role of the Attorney General is not just to make sure that the laws are enforced, but that they are applied equally. And I, I believe it's an, it's, it's an adequate, equal application of the laws to allow for uh, uh, excelling to be based on merit as opposed to teachers giving grades or uh, keeping people in, in one class, in one system, at one level. Our, our, our students, our children, our kids, if you will, compete on the world schedule or on, on the world uh, platform at some level, at some day, in some way, uh, and I think they need to be prepared for that. So uh, there are a lot of people who go to school that, that don't want to be doctors, don't want to be lawyers, don't want to be engineers. Perhaps they want to be uh, you know, mechanics. Perhaps they want to be teachers. Perhaps they want to be accountants. Uh, I do not believe uh, that we should force people uh, into a school system that only offers one opportunity for them. And so I, I am on the side of those people who believe that it is not discrimination to have a policy which is based on how well a student can excel. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. White. TJ is the pride and joy of Fairfax County Public Schools. Uh, TJ is the pride and joy of Virginia. TJ is the pride and joy of public schools in the United States and what we can accomplish through our public school system. But the Attorney General does have a role here because the Attorney General is counsel to every board and agency. And understanding that role is pivotally important. Look, I have served as corporate counsel to companies, large and small, public and private. My job in that role is not to cover up wrongdoing. It's to help them operate most efficiently 
within the confines of the law. That's the role of the attorney general. And that's the role that General Herring has abrogated because what he should have been doing all along is walking alongside TJ as an institution. That's his client as an institution, as part of Virginia. And that's what we're missing here. Now, it is imperative that we apply the precepts of equal protection, but it's also important for the Commonwealth that we preserve that treasure that is in TJ. So what we need is an attorney general who fully understands and is fully engaged in their role in all of its parts being counsel to every board and agency, but also representing the constitutional interests to make sure that the laws are fairly applied. Thank you, Mr. White. Ms. Haley. And, and I have to say, you know, I agree with that. I mean, that is the role of the Attorney General. The Attorney General does have um, a wide vast of uh, clients across the Commonwealth in all of these boards and in all of these institutions. And, and what is missing is the fact that while TJ has its own special acknowledgement, you know, replicating those types of, of schools that meet other students' achievements, high achievements, is what's missing right now in public education. And there's an opportunity there for the Attorney General through boards and commissions in which he or she serves to actually advance that. So people don't recognize the breadth of the power that exists there when you're looking at what that impact can be. And so while TJ doesn't have to be the standalone, because there can be other models that exist to allow other types of students with other great academic or otherwise skill sets to advance, you know, we need to challenge public education to look different and to meet the constitutional rights of all of our citizens. So while one institution becomes challenged over that, what we should be looking at is the opportunity to then take that message and meet and, and teach that into how we can meet and serve the rest of our population of students that are not just diverse students, but they have diverse skill sets and diverse attributes and diverse fabulous um, things they can add to our society. Look, look at how we advance those and we bring that back to, you know, my, one of my pet peeves candidly with education is, you know, that the aspect that sometimes we're not really challenging our teachers. We have a basically base system of pay. It's a meritless based system of pay. We need to work harder to challenge that, bring that back to advance our children for the next generation. Thank you, Ms. Haley. For the next question, we'll bring back Vincent Polythengal. Thank you, Steve. For the next question, we will follow the candidate order. Uh, Mr. Smith first, Mr. White, Ms. Haley, and Mr. Meiras. This is the question. The Republican laws of the General Assembly in 2019 gave Democrats free reign to make changes to the election process. That, coupled with pandemic-related measures, arguably weakened election integrity. What is your view of Virginia's current election system? And if there were one or two specific things you would modify about Virginia's election laws and systems to enhance security, what would they be? Mr. Smith. Number one on the board, take all Wi-Fi and internet out of the same room where you have the electric machines. Number two on the board, make sure that these machines have been checked before, before each election. Number three, allow, pull, uh, allow um, watchers, uh, people to stand and watch. Uh, if, 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 if you have uh, uh, a Democratic watcher, you have a a Republican watcher, you have people from different parties, people from different sections being able to watch the polls. I think it's a, uh, I think it's a crime in it of itself 
to have something that's so fundamental to the Constitution, our existence, the election of government, if you will, to uh, proceed without some type of check and balance there, to proceed without uh, watchers, to proceed where the machines can quickly connect or hook up to uh, uh, outside uh, machines or outside entities uh, uh, on the internet or by Wi-Fi. I think the role of the Attorney General is to make sure that our election laws, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, certainly our election laws, but our election systems and our elect election machines are intact. I often say that uh, the people's right to vote is what makes government. You take away the right to vote, government ceases to exist. And by its very nature, I think the, the responsibility of the Attorney General is to make sure that we have the appropriate security. Uh, I think, obviously, we need to look at the software. If, if all we can do is get rid of the machines lock and barrel, then let's go back to the old fashioned way of counting elections by hand. Let's, let's bring integrity back to the system rather than uh, to proceed on technology where technology in many ways has failed us. Do I believe there was election fraud? Of course I do. Do I believe it happened in Virginia? Of course I do. Uh, uh, we have to do what we can to restore integrity to people. Otherwise, they will not vote. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. White. I'm not a huge fan of anything that involves large federal government. But every once in a while, the federal government does something right. I mean, a broken clock is right twice a day. Uh, the FEC, the Federal Elections Commission, has independence. And part of the way that it has independence is that it has people of both parties on it. Now, I am not suggesting necessarily that we create more bureaucracy in Virginia. But I think the principle undergirding that is having an independent set of eyes looking at elections. Now look, back in, after the election of 2016, in 2017, there was a wide swath of the electorate who questioned the efficacy and the legitimacy of the, the election. After 2020, right now, there's a wide swath of the electorate questioning, legitimately so, the integrity of the election. A fundamental problem here is that we are watching a, 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 a gradual deterioration in the confidence of the people in the elections. Part of what brings that back is strict enforcement. I've looked at the laws on the book in the Commonwealth of Virginia. There are some strong laws. They are not being enforced. This is a problem that is enigmatic of our current attorney general, but enforce the laws that are on the book. If you are engaged in election fraud under attorney general White, then we're gonna throw the book at you because what you are compromising is that which is most sacred in our democracy, our ability and right to vote. Thank you, Mr. White. Ms. Haley. I think that we absolutely start fundamentally with the aspect of the Attorney General enforcing the laws that are on the books. So, for instance, right now we have laws on the books that talk about when and how voter rolls should be purged when people are deceased. And nobody is maintaining the integrity of purging those rolls on a, on a routine basis. So, we start with that, and folks don't recognize that those laws exist and have not in spite of the, the actions being taken by current attorney, our current General Assembly, those laws still remain on the books. But our Attorney General, again, has just turned at his head and refused to acknowledge those laws exist. I mean, the federal government has given the power to the states to handle these electoral issues. And this is another opportunity where the Attorney General can rise strong and look for consistency throughout jurisdictions, consistency in messaging, and help this discussion move forward. Transparency is a huge part of this. And so one of the most critical, important, and easy things to do immediately is to bring in oversight, bring in both parties to the table, allow them to have folks watching over this process, watching the vote counting, making sure it's a transparent process. But again, going back to just starting from the fundamental basis of enforcing the rules and the laws that exist on the books, 
that puts some integrity back in the process, letting folks know that there is an attorney general that is engaged in this process and is going to hold accountabilities at the end of the day and not is not going to be afraid to challenge, take it to the courts if you have to take it to the courts, challenge what's happening if in fact one party seems to be out of control when it comes to the electoral integrity. Thank you, Ms. Haley. Mr. Mieras. Yeah, I mean, I think the media has been fundamentally dishonest the way they portray. This has been an issue that has had actually, leading up to the 2020 election, it was bipartisan. They did polling that showed a huge swath of Republicans and a huge amount of Democrats had real fundamental disillusionment with our current uh, voting system and with election integrity. And it's only now they're making it sound like it's, not a, it's just a conservative issue. It's not just a conservative issue. Fundamentally, it's an American issue. And I think that's absolutely critical. I mean, if you require a photo ID to get on an airplane, if you require a photo ID to pick up your tickets at will call, hello, Major League Baseball, then there's absolutely nothing wrong to require a voter ID to actually be able to vote. And it's not controversial. We've seen polling after polling that shows the vast majority of Americans support the concept of some type of voter ID, which is the first step to election integrity. It's also critical to make sure the Democrats just voted to get rid of um, the signature requirement on our absentee ballots, uh, which is absolutely outrageous. So I think it's critical to have an attorney general that recognizes the importance, it's not just the theory as well. I, I had a dear friend, he called me up on election day. He's Indian American, he went to go vote, he couldn't vote. Somebody had literally taken his name and voted in his place. And as he told me, he said, Jason, I cast a provisional ballot. At most, it meant that my vote got canceled, at most. And that is a direct violation of people's 14th Amendment right. The fact that people are able to use, we have a system that is so loose right now that people can literally take someone's identification or you just go into a polling place and give them their name and vote in their place. That goes directly to the heart of our democracy. So one of my pledges as a candidate for attorney general is I will set up the Office of Election Integrity of those attorneys that have full-time job in that office is to protect the sacred, sacred right of one man and one vote so your voice is heard because right now when you have a, this amount of disillusionment as people have had in our voting process, it's ultimately hurting the mark, it's hurting our republic and it's hurting our, our country. Thank you, Mr. Mayoris. Now I invite Heather Rice for the next round, the lightning round. Welcome candidates, you've made it to the lightning round. You will have one minute there were four questions, and the first question, the order will be White, Haley, Mieris, and Smith. Question one, party solidarity. If you are not elected to the Republican as a Republican nominee for Attorney General, do you pledge to throw your support behind the candidate who does not who does win the Republican nomination? Okay, I heard enough of that question. So, um, Ms. Rice, you're coming in a little bit broken, but I heard enough of that to answer. Enthusiastically, yes. I'm looking at uh, my fellow contestants in this race. And if the people of Virginia make the mistake of not selecting me, uh, and I'm being facetious, then I will absolutely throw my support behind whomever is our nominee. Look, we need to win. That's the reason I entered this race. I entered the race because I think I get us to victory. But most important is not Jack White. Most important is we need to get a Republican Attorney General, a true conservative in that office. Thank you, Mr. White, Ms. Haley. Thank you, and the answer is absolutely. I mean, we've all been out and around the state talking to folks and we're all seeing the energy that's going on right now. And I think collectively we recognize that we need to be gathering and getting behind the best candidate that can take us to victory in November. And whoever the people choose that candidate to be, we are all united in that quest. We are all united to win this back and we all really recognize what it is risk, what is at risk, and the answer is yes. Thank you, Ms. Haley. Mr. Mayeris. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, Chuck, 
and Jack and Leslie, you get to know these candidates very well when you're out as much as we all are on the trail. And we know their stories and we know their platforms. And each one of them I know from day one can serve as an excellent attorney general. And the absolute uh, other best part, not only their personal attributes, I mean, they, they are running because they're passionate and they love Virginia. Uh, and I think that is critical. And they, they, they fundamentally, everybody on this call, on this uh, Zoom right now understands, I think, what it takes to restore Virginia for this great Virginia comeback. So I absolutely look forward to, uh, hopefully I have the hope to have the honor to be the standard bearer, but if I'm not, uh, then I look forward to coming alongside these fine gentlemen and this fine uh, uh, woman and helping them in every way possible because the best part about them is all, as long as they're individual attributes as well, none of them are Mark Herring, which means it's automatically an upgrade in the office. So I look forward to helping them in any way I can. Thank you, Mr. Meehan. Mr. Smith. Yes, uh, Jack, Leslie, and Jason, I expect you to get behind me when I win. Um, if, if, if somehow um, I do not win. Listen, having been a former chairman, I, I lead that charge. Uh, we've got to get behind each other. We have to win this election. It's critically important. And, and yes, without the shadow of a doubt, uh, I will support the Republican nominee. That is why I'm a Republican. That, that is what I signed up for, because we're going to win this election, whether it's with me or whether it's with e either one of my colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you, candidates. I'm now turning this over for question two with Steve. Thank you, Heather. So past the election, you're uh, elected attorney general for the state of Virginia. What is the first thing you'll do as attorney general the minute you walk through the door on day one? Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the first response will be from Ms. Haley. Well, thank you for that question. I think honestly, the first, the first thing we're gonna have to do um, in response to the current administration is to set some real protocols and procedures in place as to the expectations of that office and letting citizens know that there is you know, now an attorney general that is going to be serving on behalf of the citizens and is not afraid to engage across the Commonwealth with boards, with citizen groups, with other Commonwealth attorneys and hold accountabilities to engage with the General Assembly and to, to immediately start to look at the enactment of all of these new these new legislative acts and see you know which ones really need to be challenged because i mean they're not done you know we know we're only in april and look what happened today so they're not done so we need to be looking right away and stepping up to the plate challenging some of the constitutionality of things that have happened in the past thank you miss haley mr miatis Think of our schools closed. I will bring a lawsuit against any school that's not reopened because they're in violation of the Virginia Constitution. You don't have a right to an education under the U.S. Constitution. You do have a right to an education in the Virginia Constitution. We're literally losing an entire generation of kids. And I think shortly thereafter that I will issue subpoenas and begin an immediate investigation of the parole board that is violating the law, literally making Virginians less safe with this criminal first, victim last mentality. And I think the third thing is recognize that personnel is policy. I don't think it's important um, that I get elected as much as who are the good people, the people that want to follow the Constitution, those those conservatives that you bring in, those conservative attorneys that actually you bring in in your office. I think that's critical. Uh, that's something that's one of Morton Blackwell's rules of public policy is that personnel is policy. I think that is absolutely true. I think sometimes we fail as Republicans and conservatives if we don't make sure we have people that share our full fundamental philosophical worldview within that office as well. Thank you, Mr. Meadows. Mr. Smith. Declare unconstitutional every single law that was passed in January 2020 that transcends the Constitution and proceed thereafter to challenge those laws in court. The people deserve better. The people uh, uh, deserve better because the Constitution provides that as a guarantee. You can't have violations of the Second Amendment. You can't have violations of the First Amendment, where the Constitution clearly says it shall not be done. Congress shall pass no law. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. White. Professionalize the office. 
let me explain what I mean by that. I have, uh, when I was in the army, I took command of units before. Uh, in my civilian professional life, I have assumed leadership roles in organizations. Leadership is interactive. But right now, we need a course correction in the office of the attorney general. Every attorney will get a meeting with attorney general White at the outset. 10 minutes, every attorney. Now, that's a lot of time. And it's a big investment because there are uh, over 150. But I will do a lot of listening. But there is a message that I'm going to send to everybody. You be a lawyer. Do your job. All of the other stuff belongs to me because I'm the elected. But be a professional and do your job. The first thing is to professionalize the office. Everything else will come in line once you have solid leadership from the top. Thank you, Mr. White, and thank you all. Uh, for the next question, we'll bring Vincent back again. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, for the next question, we will follow the order. Mr. Mieres first, Mr. Smith, Mr. White, and then Mr. Haley. As Attorney General, if there were a law passed that reduces our Second Amendment rights, would you enforce that law? Mr. Mieres. No, because in the day you you swore an oath of allegiance to the U.S. Constitution. That's your first oath of allegiance, and then obviously to follow the Virginia Constitution. And we know right now, I mean, we're seeing with this current administration, there's a wholesale assault on our Second Amendment rights, and we know fundamentally the Second Amendment is what guarantees the First Amendment. I mean, what what do we know that every single autocratic regime in the history of the world always does? It always disarms its population, and this is, you know, very personal for me. My my mother has vivid memories during the Bay of Pig invasion in Cuba, waking up in the middle of the night with, with the Castro security forces banging on her door, uh, asking that they were actually there to arrest her brother, my uncle, who's an anti-Castro right. What was the very first question they asked? First question they asked was, where are your firearms? And so we've seen this repeated out throughout history. So I'm proud of my lifetime A rating with the NRA, my 98 or 99% rating with the VCDL. But I think it's absolutely critical that you have an attorney general that will always stand for our Second Amendment. Thank you, Mr. Mieres. Mr. Smith. Absolutely not. Uh, what part of shall not be infringed can we not understand? These rights are not given to us by the founders. They're not given to us by legislatures. They're guaranteed in the Constitution because these rights come from God, the right to defend ourselves. All species on this planet have a right of defense. And I believe the Second Amendment, just like the First Amendment, just like each one of the 10 Bill of Rights, and certainly just like the other amendments, these are guaranteed rights. I will uphold those rights. I will uphold the Second Amendment. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. White. Will I defend our Second Amendment rights? Yes. But I think what's most important is knowing how to do it. I was a law clerk at the United States Supreme Court when the court decided Heller. And I, had, I, I remember vividly reading uh, the files before the uh, opinion was rendered. The way that we handle the Second Amendment is fundamentally flawed. You know, under the First Amendment, if a newspaper prints an article that contains libel in it, you know, they've, uh, they, uh, they have operated contrary to the First Amendment, but we don't shut down the national press. Similarly, even if there are people who are errant in Colorado, in Georgia. We don't get to abrogate the Second Amendment as to all. You deal with the problem where it is, not take away a, a, an enumerated right. Thank you, Mr. White. Ms. Haley. And the answer is absolutely. I would absolutely stand behind our Second Amendment rights. I would never, um, and I will challenge Constitution challenge any attempt, any attempt, and that means any bill that in any way goes after or infringes upon Second Amendment rights. I am a, pr a proud concealed carry permit holder. I am proud to stand um, up for our Second Amendment rights, and I think that again, it is. It's a fundamental right. It doesn't stand alone and separate from the rest of our rights. Puts every other one of our First Amendment, Tenth Amendment, Fourteenth Amendment, Fourth Amendment rights in jeopardy. We need to stand strong, would never 
uh, would always defend our Second Amendment rights. Thank you, Ms. Haley. Now I invite Ms. Heather Rights for the next question. Thank you, Vincent. Candidates, the next question is about Republican candidates. The candidate order for this question is Smith, White, Haley, and Nieves. The question, we understand that each of you are Republicans and conservatives. What separates you from fellow Attorney General candidates? My, my conviction, um, what I believe in, uh, I believe the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, without a doubt. There are no exceptions. The Constitution does not take a lunch break. It doesn't take a spring break. It doesn't go out for a hike. It is always there. I believe the Constitution itself has been given to us by the founders. The rights therein have been guaranteed because these are rights that come from God. But I believe the Constitution is there and the government should work around the Constitution. I fundamentally believe that that's how I will respond as Attorney General. And I, I, I believe, based on what I've known about these candidates, uh, God bless them all, but I believe that that fundamentally separates me from them. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. White. I am a warrior. I'm a warrior for our freedoms. I'm a warrior for our constitution. Now, listen to me closely. I did not say I'm a fighter because you can fight and lose. A warrior looks at the battlefield, assesses the battlefield, figures out what needs to be brought to bear, what needs to come to the fight, and a warrior wins. On the issues that we've discussed today, I have been thinking about them for years. I've been reading about them for years. I've been litigating them for years. Freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, the Second Amendment, the overreach of the federal government, why the state governments deserve autonomy. How do we preserve our freedoms? That's why I'm a conservative. That's why I'm in this race. I am a warrior for our freedoms. And that's what our party needs. That's what our state needs right now. Thank you, Mr. White, Ms. Haley. Thank you. I can tell you my whole life has been built on conservative principles and the other pieces has been built on public service. I actually went to law school because I believed I could make a difference in this world. And I think this is an opportunity coming from a very conservative background, raising children on conservative principles, standing up for pro-life, standing up for our educational system, our conservative principles in education, for our second amendment, and coming to the table as someone who has spent the entirety of the last 25 years in the community doing work to reinstate and to continue to uphold conservative principles throughout the community, including in my church community where I've served, including on church count as, as head of church council. It's been evidenced all along, and this I believe is truly public service taking it to the next level and making a real difference in this Commonwealth. Thank you, Ms. Haley. Mr. Maitis. Listen, I think one of the things that separates me is I think one of the great debates we're gonna have in the next several decades, decisions we make, we're gonna decide what Virginia and what America we're gonna have. Are we gonna follow the siren call of socialism and the far left, or are we gonna fall, we'll go back to the very values of what made uh, Virginia such a unique beacon of freedom throughout um, to the founding of our nation? And when you're looking at that and somebody who's literally grew up hearing those stories firsthand of what happens when socialism takes over, where they use these catchphrases we hear so many politicians use, like fairness and equity and redistribution of wealth, and you didn't build that. That is absolutely visceral because I know firsthand you can have these slogans that sound great to the ear, but the reality is they trample on people's rights and liberties. I think that's the first. The second is... I think it's critical when we're talking about this job about Virginia's top cop, having somebody who's literally been a prosecutor, literally sit in front of juries. And if you have too many politicians right now that are focused on the criminals and they forget the victims, I've been in the room with the victims of violent crime. They are desperate, desperate not to be forgotten. And I think that bringing those very real visceral stories to the campaign trail, I look forward to having that debate in the fall. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nieves. I now turn the forum over to Vincent Palafango for closing statements. Yes, uh, you know, we are doing very good with the timings, with your discipline. So you have earned it. You guys have three minutes each for your closing statements. I will 
go with Mr. Smith first. So thank you for this. Uh, it's really been enjoyable. We've 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 answered the questions I think as best we can. I I always think it's good for the voters. Uh, not just to listen to our answers, but look back at our lives, uh, look back at our resumes, and just make sure that the things that we have said are found somewhere in the resume. I'll tell you that of the four candidates, uh, I am the only one that uh, is a Marine. I enlisted in the Marine Corps in 1970 at the height of the Vietnam War. Uh, I'm the only one, to my knowledge, that is a Navy JAG. I retired as a Navy JAG commander after 26 years of combined military service, active and active in reserve. And yes, I was a prosecutor. And yes, I prosecuted cases before juries, a lot of them. I'm the only one in this race who is the former chairman of the largest Republican Party city committee in the Commonwealth. Why is that important? Because therein is the conservative loyalty. I was charged with the responsibility to elect Republicans, elect conservatives. Uh, I'm the only one in this race who has practiced law for 41 years. Mind you, that is longer than anyone in, 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 in this group. But most importantly, it is longer than the incumbent. It is longer than anybody on, on the, uh, on, on the uh, Democratic side. In fact, it is longer than anyone, to my knowledge, who's ever run for the Office of Attorney General in 400 years. I'm the only one in this race who has practiced federal law, state law, Iowa law, Virginia law, military law, constitutional law, criminal law, civil law, and immigration. Uh, uh, and, and of course, I'm the only one in this race, uh, it, to my knowledge, who's been born on the 4th of July. Try hard as they might, they're not going to get that last one. Uh, let me say this. Uh, I believe we have a lot to accomplish here. We've got to convince the voters that we can beat the incumbent. I believe we have to convince the voters that, that we will not lose uh, a, an 11th time in a row. And I believe I'm the candidate with my ability to speak Spanish fluently. I believe I'm the candidate that can reach all areas of Virginia. Uh, I think uh, the voters are looking for someone who's knowledgeable, articulate, bilingual, charismatic, dynamic, and energetic. I think I am that person. Thank you all so much. It was a joy to be here. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Mieros. Listen, I think so much, So often as people uh, hear me, part of the biggest reason why I'm running is I want to preserve this American miracle. I like to say we're a nation of second chances. Uh, but you can't preserve the American miracle, for example, if you don't defend life. I'm proud to be the 2018 Family Foundation Legislator of the Year. Uh, Virginia Democrats have come a long way from when Bill Clinton used to say he wanted to make abortion safe, legal, and rare. And now we have this governor who wants to make it anytime, anywhere, up until the moment of birth paid for by taxpayers. Um, you can't preserve this American miracle, as, as I've said before, if you have the doors to our schools closed and the doors to our prisons open. Uh, I'm the only candidate who's put forth the Protect Virginia Now Amendment to abolish parole for violent offenders because we know if anybody who's been a prosecutor will tell you well north of 80 percent of violent crimes is done by repeat offenders and they say the only thing you learn from history is nobody learns from history. The, the far left is pushing these, so uh, these criminal justice reforms that we all tried in the 1970s to disastrous result that's going to lead to more victims and a less safe Virginia. Uh, I'm running for attorney general because I don't think we can have two systems, a system for the elites and the media and then a system for everybody else. Because we saw this past year where we had small business owners who saw their life work go up in flames in Richmond, all because the media and the governor and the attorney general and the mayor in Richmond decided none of these people should ever be prosecuted. They were told they, their shop was literally destroyed in the name of social justice. That is the opposite of justice being blind. It shows the upside down world right now that we have in Richmond and how much we desperately need a check and balance of what one party rule is doing because we have too many politicians in Richmond who think we're Vermont and not Virginia. But I think this campaign is gonna decide whether we're gonna be the northernmost Southern state or the southernmost Northern state. We're either gonna be more like Florida and Texas and South Carolina or we're gonna be more like New York. Well, I don't wanna be like New York, we're Virginians. We, we have a unique country, a unique state and literally turning back the clock and pushing this far less agenda has made us less safe. So we're calling people that want to come with us and, and support us on May 8th, our freedom builders. Uh, please visit my website, jason4ag.com. I hope everybody would sign up, get a little bit more information. I'm proud of the campaign team that we built together. Great conservatives, George Allen's my state co-chair, uh, Nick Freitas, Ben Kleins, Bob McDonald, so many others. Uh, have um, have decided to stand with me. I'm honored by everybody that's decided to stand with me. But as I tell people, listen, if I can't be your first choice, 
my sure heart as heck hope is that I can be your second. And I look forward, I've met so many of you all out on the campaign trail. I look forward to seeing so many of you all as well on the campaign trail. And I know each one of you are here on this nice night uh, and not outside because you love Virginia. And for that, I thank you and I applaud you. I look forward to seeing everybody in the trail ahead. Go to jason4ag.com to get more information. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mr. Mieres. Now, Mr. White. Uh, Virginia is at a crossroads. But not only is Virginia at a crossroads, Virginia is also in a leadership position because this race gets to inform the narrative for the future of our country. Uh, a lot of eyes are what we are on what we're doing here in Virginia right now. And look, there is an assault that we are about to endure. The Biden administration just spent $1.9 trillion under the label COVID. And friends, that was not about COVID. That was about labeling an expansive government reach into our lives, $2.5 trillion labeled as infrastructure spending. Look, I'm a licensed civil engineer. There are not $2.5 trillion worth of roads and bridges and tunnels to build, but it is the price tag of getting the federal government more involved in impeding your freedoms. What we need right now is an attorney general with a degree of legal sophistication equal to the task of challenging these. I didn't just visit the Supreme Court, I clerked there. I'm not just licensed at the Supreme Court. I've practiced there and at, in federal and state courts throughout the country, and I do to this day. In order to challenge this overreach, we have to understand the issues and be able to deal with them. But we also have to lead an office. We need an attorney general who can lead an office that can address many issues aside from federal government overreach that are plaguing the people of the Commonwealth of Virginia. I am that warrior. I am that leader. And I'm the only candidate who is from here in Northern Virginia and understands our issues because they're my issues too. They're the issues that led me to come to Virginia, they're the issues that are making me enter into this race and addressing them, they will be the issues that will lead us to victory. I can't wait to run against a Mark Herring who had to put on blackface in order to relate to people who look like me. I don't have to wear blackface, I have a blackface. And I can't wait to make the arguments in favor of freedom in our common defense. Visit me at votejackwhite.com and I look forward to talking with you further. Thank you, Mr. White. Now, Ms. Haley. Well, thank you. So first of all, I think one of the important things I bring to this is that I am and have been an executive. 10 years with Philip Morris, I can only tell you how many people as in a management role that I had the opportunity to not only train, but hire, sometimes fire, um, but certainly to position into executive, other executive positions. But in addition to that, I have, I've litigated in all state courts, federal courts, and I am admitted to the United States Supreme Court. And so there is no issue that I'm not, that I'm afraid to challenge. And I can tell you, in the work that I've done just on our board of supervisors in Chesterfield, I've put kids back in school. I've supported our men and women in blue. It's absolutely evident right now as we sit 100% fully staffed in a time when in 25 years of history, we don't even remember that happening. With all of our citizens standing alongside us as just tonight, we passed a budget here in Chesterfield earlier with 100% support from our citizens and what we're doing and how we're moving. So that is a message that can resonate throughout the Commonwealth. And I will tell you also that I serve and proudly serve on behalf of our underserved children as a guardian ad litem in our courts. 
I work with our Office of Executive Secretary, and I recognize the diversity and the needs that exist throughout this Commonwealth and those that don't have a voice that need to have a voice. So one of the things I think that also distinguishes me is I'm not a career politician. You're not gonna see me run for governor. I am running for attorney general because I do believe that this again is part of public service for me and something that the Lord has blessed me with and brought me to this point. So I'm absolutely pro-life. I'm appalled by what we're seeing and what we're hearing that we've got situations where we not only, you know, this liberal government believes not only that you can abort in the birth canal, but even after as a mom, this is just not the world I wanna to leave to my children and my future grandchildren. So I ask you to join me as well on this journey. I am at Haley, H-A-L-E-Y 4AG.com. I know we've all got the passion to do this. I think we need to look forward to the candidate that can challenge the Democrat in November and win. I think we've got opportunities here to put a fabulous ticket together. We need to take back this Commonwealth. So thank you all so much for your time tonight and for your interest. Thank you, Ms. Haley. And thank you all the candidates for joining us on this important forum organized by the 8th, 10th, and 11th district committees. Now I invite the 8th committee chairman, Andrew Lopesel, for the concluding remarks. Hey, Vincent, thank you so much. And thank you to all the candidates for being here tonight, uh, Mr. White, Mr. Smith, Supervisor Haley, and uh, Delegate Miares. We really appreciate you guys being here. Um, I'm familiar with how tough the campaign trail is, so thank you. Um, and thank you for all you're doing to advance our conservative principles across the Commonwealth. It's not an easy thing to do, and we really appreciate all of you picking up the mantle and doing that. Also want to thank all our moderators this evening. Uh, thank you all. Uh, this this um, forum went really smooth, uh, and we're ending right on time, probably ahead of time, actually. Um, thank you to our rules committee and our timekeepers. Just thank you, everybody, for all you did tonight. Um, also, I want to announce we have a few more forums coming up. We have the Lieutenant Governor Forum that's coming up on 414, and we have the Gubernatorial Forum that's coming up on 421. So it's April 14th and April 21st. Those will both be at 7 p.m. And again, thank all you guys for coming out tonight um, virtually. But uh, this has been great. We, we look forward to seeing more with the candidates have the Lieutenant Governor Forum, the Gubernatorial Forum. But thank you to all the AG candidates that were out tonight. We really appreciate you being here. And again, thank you guys so much. Okay. Thank you.